friends. Welcome to episode 108 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 14th year, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast does something for you. This week, I'd like to extend a very special welcome to listeners Mike in Taiwan, Joe and Julie in Alabama, Jesse in California, Courtney in Nebraska, and Janelle in Minnesota. Janelle made my day when she emailed me this week. Janelle said, Hello, Amy. I have been listening to your episodes for a while now, and I find that you bring guests and episodes that are so timely to the work that I'm doing and the conversations that I'm having with my colleagues about our work. I've recently been finding myself suggesting to colleagues that they listen to a variety of your episodes related to the conversations we are having, and I thought it was time that I share this with you and say thank you for the time you are making to contribute to all of our professional learning networks. Thank you so much, Janelle. The shared listening experience which a a chosen episode can provide just might be the way to initiate change in your library and in your district. Word of mouth remains the best way to create this listening community, and I truly appreciate everyone who enjoys the podcast enough to recommend it to their team and their PLN. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and your episode suggestions, either on Facebook, Twitter, or the email address, schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a sticker. Friends, before we meet today's guest, I wanted to share with you a unique pandemic-approved opportunity. If you have ever had the chance in the before times to participate in an ed camp or an unconference, you know just how rewarding these types of PD can be. Volunteers sign up to moderate a conversation on a topic of their choosing. It's not a formal presentation. Rather, it's a crowdsourcing event in which participants share and collaborate in different sessions. Anyone who has ever worked with Christina Holzweiss, author of the book Hacking School Libraries, is instantly aware of her ingenuity and unceasing drive to unite and support school librarians everywhere. Christina has spearheaded a fantastic event called Ed Camp Cardigan Camp, scheduled for February 27th from 10 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. In this time, we will have four 40-minute blocks of time with 10 sessions offered for each of the four blocks. We are hoping to attract an international participants to facilitate sessions for this event in the different time zones to accommodate all the corners of the world. If you are interested, join the EdCamp Cardigan Camp Facebook page to learn more. And now for our episode, Broadcasting from the Library, and my conversation with Dustin McConnell. excited to be talking today with Dustin McConnell, and you are not going to believe all the great things we're going to share with you today. So, um, Dustin, welcome to the podcast. I'm glad to be here. No, friends, I'm just going to start off right now. Dustin is a um, self-proclaimed B-type personality. He is not our type A, which I I assumed all of us were. Uh, That makes him the the unicorn of uh, in the librarian world who is type B. So, Dustin, can you just, I mean... I would love to hear how does that help you do your job? Because I know that my type A personality is something I can't uh, avoid, but it sounds like you recognize your personality as one that works well in your space. I just, I mean, being a librarian and the things that go on every day, 
you always hear that you need to be flexible in teaching or you're not going to make it. And so I just feel like having a type B personality helps me because I'm able to to just roll with it. And especially this year, um, maybe it's because I don't know any different because this is my first year as a librarian, but I definitely feel like my, my uh, media assistant will frequently, people will ask a question like, is he going to mind if we do this or we do that? And I'm like, she's always just like, no, he's not going to care. <laughs> <laughs> do what you need to do. And so I guess it helps me not irritate people, I guess, or um, just they feel like they can come to me with things. And even if they feel like maybe they did something wrong, I'm just going to tell them I didn't lose any sleep over it. Don't worry. And <laughs> go from there. Well, and I, I really do think that's another podcast episode of itself because, you know, the idea is so much of our, you know, I think librarians tend to be so, such planners and, and so incredibly organized and we think things through and everyone I talk to says, oh, I'm an overthinker. And I'm like, oh yeah, welcome to the club. But you know, you're <laughs> right that especially when we're dealing right now in, in the case of a pandemic, so much of us were sort of a hit, uh, like a wall because we, we were so accustomed to being planful and being being able to anticipate and to be able to to see things uh, as they as they as they come and you know so much has been uh, unexpected in this in this uh, strange uh, new world we're in right now. So, Dustin, would you please set the stage for us? You know, uh, describe your current library. Where can we find you in the world? And what is your uh, teaching uh, circumstances like right now during the time of a pandemic? So. I live and teach in Somerville, South Carolina. Um, my school is next in elementary school. Um, and we are on a hybrid, have a hybrid type situation. So we have traditional students that are in the school, and then we have virtual students as well. And it started out originally, um, our school is the only one in the district. Actually, this is kind of just an interesting side note that went with like, okay, some teachers are going to do traditional and some are going to do virtual. So it started out that my fixed schedule was, yeah, I was either teaching a traditional or a virtual, and now it is a mix. It's blended is what they call it, and it changes literally weekly um, who's coming in and who's not and who's with what teacher. And actually, we just made the decision. I do the yearbook, too. Like, it's so difficult to, tr to track all the switching around that we're just doing by grade level in the yearbook because – Teachers were frustrated, like, what do I put? I've had 50 different kids come through my classroom who were actually my students in the yearbook. And um, so, yeah, so, yeah. so it's crazy. <laughs> we're having that uh, a problem right now in my buildings because everyone's trying to, for the first time in the, the entire school year, do school pictures. Now, uh -huh. never in my teaching career have I done school pictures. It's almost February, friends. It's like, uh -huh. but, but something <laughs> as mundane and ordinary and everyday as school pictures gets really convoluted when you have, mm -hmm. you, you have your virtual students, you know, you, and you're, for us, we're in a hybrid situation, which means we only have physically half of the building there at any given time. And so you're right. I mean, having that sort of, um, you know, B personality, being able to go with the flow, it really serves you because you're not going to get, uh, you know, flustered if something unexpected pops up on your yeah. radar. All right. So, you know, and I also, before I get any further, you mentioned you're in South Carolina and, yeah. uh, you know, friends, for those of you who are willing to travel, to relocate, to find a job, you know, Dustin shared with me uh, a little bit about the job outlook of school librarians in South Carolina. And Dustin, would you just share with us a little bit, because I know there are some librarians, I'm not one of them, but have some opportunities to relocate if they wanted to. So at least as of about two years ago or three years ago, I guess, whenever I started the program, um, being a media specialist was considered a critical need. They didn't have enough to fill the positions. Um, so, and I had come down here originally from Indiana and it was even difficult to get teaching jobs when I first came down. And so South Carolina just has a huge, and I don't know what it's like. I haven't kept up on the Midwest stuff, but South Carolina has a huge teaching shortage. And I believe they also have, um, I believe they still have a media specialist shortage. Although I do know a lot more people that have started going into it. Um, they offer, there's some like state offered scholarships. They will pay, I think it's up to like $5,000 will be forgiven within five years. Um, as I was telling you a little bit before, I did not accomplish that because I just filled out paperwork wrong or something. I was in a hurry trying to, um, I was going through a teaching crisis and just needed 
that was part of my story was just I needed to get out of the classroom. I thought at the time I ended up liking it by the time I finished um, my master's, but I was like, I didn't go into all this set to not be a librarian. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think there are opportunities. I haven't like checked the page today. I was never worried. I knew that I would at least find, and I don't mean to shame elementary librarians or say it's like a bad gig, but people seem to not want to do it because it's more of the fixed schedule. Um, I don't want to guarantee anybody you can find a job down here, but I could probably point you in the right direction where you could find a job down here. If you, if anybody does reach out, I can give you some districts to try looking. <laughs> well, and I, I appreciate that because I'll tell you in, in the Midwest, in Metro Detroit, our districts are shrinking and we, that's been a trend for more than 10 years. And it, it's completely and 100% connected to the automotive industry. So unfortunately, uh-huh. um, this, this isn't going to improve anytime soon. And I, I know my friends in, in, uh, out in the uh, Atlanta suburbs, also they they described uh, their situation where their their um, enrollment was doubling every ten years. That uh-huh. that's just absolutely incredible. And I know that for so many of us who want desperately to either be a school librarian or remain school librarians, finding finding job opportunities is absolutely key. So I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. I think our school district initiative was like. A couple of years ago, it was like 20 schools in 20 years. We're outside of Charleston is where my suburb is. And I don't know that they're accomplishing that, but they thought, anticipated they're going to need 20 new schools in the next 20 years. So Wow. Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, so gorgeous. I, I have only been briefly, but I, as a as a former history teacher and a history buff, I <laughs> you just you it's wonderful. So I, I'm I am so delighted because when I I asked you to be on the podcast, uh, our our topic today broadcasting from the library, friends. You never really know until your guest throws an incredible page of show notes at you, but. But you are going to have to make sure you set aside time to visit all of the resources that Dustin has generously shared with us in the show notes, because it truly is a a daunting task. The first time your administrator comes to you and says, "Um, I've got a great plan, and the plan is you're going to be broadcasting the school news from the library, and you sit there and go, yep, I'm a team player. Let's do this. So friends, this is that episode, because I I really uh, appreciate Dustin has agreed to uh, hold our hands and walk us through this process. And friends, if you already broadcast in the library, I would strongly encourage you to remain listening because there's always something, whenever we do something, we can learn from others who are also uh, doing uh, similar tasks in their library spaces. It's, it's fascinating because it doesn't matter if you've been doing this for one year or five years or 20, you know, you're going to you're gonna get some great ideas. So was broadcasting from the library a program that you inherited? Was it suggested to you or were you voluntold by your school administration? Um, if I recall correctly, I was told in the interview that it would be one of my responsibilities was to broadcast from the library. Um, and I've been interested in doing something like that for ever since I first started teaching. We had a, and one of the people that actually I do a little shout out in my notes, um, AJ Chambers, and I think it's at AJ Chambers. He runs a different news program now, but at the time he ran our, it was called wave TV and it was just our high school broadcasting program. And, um, I mean, I'm not a connoisseur of school broadcast programs, but I just thought he did an awesome job. And it was actually one of the things, one of the, one of the reasons I moved or picked that school to work at was because I felt like I got such a good idea of their school culture, um, was just from watching that his new show. So, um, yeah, so I knew it was going to happen and I was kind of excited about it. Although I had no experience at all with, I won't say at all, but basically zero experience with video editing or anything like that. So, um, that's okay. Right now, listeners are nodding their heads and saying, (laughs) yeah, I, there are so many things I do and say, we're just going to go with it. Absolutely. (laughs) And I was kind of waiting for instructions. Like I thought, Oh, somebody did this before me. Oh, actually my media assistant, who was going to be my media assistant, I was told that she ran it and then um, she quit or didn't quit, went to another school. And so I got lumped with it. Actually, sorry, I'm just thinking through it. And it was like, oh, now you're doing the news. Um, So, and my media assistant now for all of her amazing qualities had no interest in running it. So. (laughs) I, I completely understand. As 
you said, you know, you just sort of like thrown into this. Can you tell me what is it you wish you knew when you were just getting started? Because e- even in the short time you have learned, I, I'm sure the learning curve is incredibly steep when you do when you broadcast from the library. But those first couple, uh, you know, shows that you put together uh, might have felt a little awkward, and I'm sure you knew there was a better way to do this. But what did you wish somebody had pulled you aside and said, "Dude, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be horrible." <laughs> Yeah. Um, I guess I wish somebody would have told me that it was, I don't know. It's a lot of fun. It can be stressful at times, but I have had a ton of fun doing it. I think once you, if you can get, I don't want to say we have the most successful show ever, you know, um, we're learning a lot as we go, but I've gotten so much positive feedback from the school and being a new librarian at the school, um, and just like needing to learn, I'm coming from a high school background. So I've learned so much about the school from running the new show and just feel like I've made so many connections that if I hadn't been running the show, I wouldn't know who these people are. But because I've put effort into kind of revamping our show a little bit, and I just have people coming to me very often to share with me what's going on in the classroom, to share with me their initiatives that they're doing in this committee or that committee. Um, So you will learn if you open your door a little bit and, you know, that's going to make life easier for you. People are going to come to you with things to put on the news, not daily, but every week I have multiple suggestions for something that we need to put on there. So I guess if I had known that the content was going to come so easily, um, I would have stressed a little less. And then I just would have liked to know anything about video editing, would have liked any sort of instructions about how to go about it. They told me I had a new show and there was nothing else. Like, you're doing the news and that was it. And that was something with librarianship in general. I thought that I was going to get all kinds of instructions and training. And it's very much just like thrown to the wolves and figure it out as you go. So, and that's normal, I think. So. And, and that's why we listen to podcasts. So uh-huh. um, you hit upon a couple things I wanted to revisit. It is fun and, and it might seem a little daunting, but ultimately doing this. And I think you, you mentioned something that's really interesting. Nobody did this before you. So everyone, it's not like they can compare you to something. It, they can't compare you to the librarian who left and had this amazing program. And you weren't continuing something. You weren't being compared to the librarian, your predecessor, especially when it came to broadcasting out of the library. And so the great thing is your school clearly recognized uh, the platform that you offer. And I love that it is an opportunity for you to get a better appreciation for all the different programs and the, and the, the, the personalities, whether the students or the staff. But would you also say that having your own platform, this broadcasting that you can do from your space, is a great opportunity to advocate for your school library? Yeah, I actually listened to the podcast two weeks ago that was talking about advocacy. And, um, you know, two things that I was thinking about a lot in that show was, One, as an elementary school teacher, it's a little bit easier to advocate for yourself because you do have a fixed schedule. So, I mean, there are classes coming all the time. But, yeah, I mean, I put – if I don't have content, I just use things we're doing in my classroom. And, you know, as a former ELA teacher, I mean, book talks fill airtime. Um, Book talks, read-alouds, all those sorts of things. Just I feel as if anybody who has questions about what's going in the library – watch the news for a while and you'll see some things. Um, And so it's a useful tool. Um, It definitely ups my value with, you know, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you want to make sure that you are valued for all sorts of reasons and not the least of which you have a collection and you have a space, but as your, your uh-huh. skills as someone who provides the, the, the broad, the daily, is it a daily broadcast that you do to? It is. it is a daily broadcast. And I'm curious just because I, I don't want to, uh, not ask this question when it comes to advocacy, because obviously, the teachers are sharing the broadcast out with each of their classes. Is there a designated time during the day when when uh, that program is is aired, or because it's elementary, they can do it any time it works for them? We do a pre recorded show every morning. So um, if it's a, I don't even know how to go about doing a live broadcast. I would have to learn that. I just for, in my head, it was always pre recorded. Um, And that was the vision I had. And so that's what I went with. And I think it was for your, we did actually have a new show, but I think it was very bare bones, like quick announcement, say the pledge. And that was it. Um, And we tried to do a three to five minute show, seven tops 
every single day. So, and and that's a lot because you you mentioned you know you the. Your previous uh, understanding had been based on the high school, and I'm going to assume those high school students were getting credit for being in a broadcasting class, which met every day. And, you know, whether it was a semester course or it was a, you know, a broadcasting one, then broadcasting two. I mean, the high school programs, the students are there for credit. Uh, are yours there because it's a club or it's strictly just kids who want to have fun? Yeah, it's a it's a club. I guess you could call it a club. We, I call it the news crew, um, and just it's an assortment of kids that I, you know, coming in, I didn't even know how to get kids. We didn't have time. Normally, I think they would have sort of trained some fourth graders up, but I didn't have any any kids. But you know, all the fifth graders left our school and went on to middle school, and so there was nobody here. So I went by teacher recommendations, and we just have a club. Um, I brought some more people in as I've, you know, as the years gone on, we can talk more about finding kids and stuff as well. Um, and I hope to bring some fourth graders in for next year. I think things will hopefully start a little more smoothly. And the one thing I did want to know, does your, do, do your families have a way to, uh, watch the recording? Um, if the student said, I want my mom and dad to see this. They do because how I've been doing it. Um, this year and I, next year we'll look into ways to change it at this point. It's the way it's been going. I just post the videos as unlisted YouTube videos and I don't even really know why I make them unlisted because I do check, you know, I, I guess my concern early on was you have to be careful about not putting kids on there that shouldn't be on there. And I was scared that I was going to accidentally put that, but you know, the teachers are virtual. They usually, I think a lot of them will just post the link in their morning activities and things like that. So, um, so there is a way to see it. Yeah. And I even in my notes posted some links for anybody who might be interested in just seeing what my show looks like. Dustin was really kind to post a weekly schedule, which uh, which is there to give you sort of, a, a you know, some focus to each day of the week. And that's great. Um, you've started to talk a little bit about this, but what, you know, in that you, you mentioned sometimes you fill in with library, but uh, are you uh, doing the morning announcements? You do the birthdays? Uh, what what kinds of things do you include in your lineup? So pretty much we just have, we do the pledge every day. Um, we do, they have a moment of silence. They greet everybody. Um, and it's kind of just like, it's just a hodgepodge a little bit. Um, nobody, unless somebody has an idea for something I should put on there, there's no like free, like you need to put this in there um i mean occasionally admin will say like we would like this to be on there or but honestly admin has been very uninvolved i think they're just okay if i have a show um that's on there then they're fine i have made it a point to try and put as many like i just try and represent the school as best as i can and just try and get as many kids on there as i can um and teachers and things going on around the school just because i felt i feel like that it's kind of interesting. You're building like a school culture is almost the way that I try and look at it. Um, and that's been just completely new coming from the classroom where you're trying to build classroom culture, trying to take that bigger and just build school culture, you know, what's going on in the school. Um, it's not the most, like if you're looking for up to date information all the time, our show is not that, um, about, you know, exactly what's happening today because we might, show something that happened last week or something that's coming up in a week or, you know, things like that. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but it is a bit of a hodgepodge and just trying to build the culture of the school, I guess, is the main thing you would see on there. Just different students, different teachers, different projects, that kind of thing. Well, and I, I know that for uh, some schools, you know, bringing in like uh, if you have the gym teacher talk up field day or you have, uh, yeah. you know, if you guys have a, a talent show that's going to uh -huh. be uh, that's going to broadcast. I appreciate that when in this particular year, it might be difficult to uh, showcase some of those what we consider more uh, typical uh, school events. But, you know, I, I wouldn't give up on the idea of bringing your administration in um, 
Tuesday Chambers uh, talked about how well received it has been in the, her particular in her high school when the building principal when the when the administration in the building gets involved in the library programming and it really does it's an endorsement it gives them yeah. a more human side and my goodness why would you pass up an opportunity to to address the entire student body you know? oh yeah they're <laughs> They would definitely be willing to do it. And there have been some things that they have spoken. Um, my principal actually, we did a, a read-a-thon activity. It was like a school initiative. And she read a book. And um, it wasn't actually on the news. It was, I made a little like read-a-thon choice board with different adults around the school reading to the kids. But um, I really, I'm working with a great administration. I had super happy <laughs> with them. But I think, yeah, getting them on there is great. That's terrific. You know, let's talk about the configuration and your library space because, friends, you know, I, I talked to Dustin about this. We we are uh, uh, this episode is coming out during the, I don't know, the, the the pandemic in the United States has has risen to distressing levels, and uh, I appreciate that there are countries around the world who are in far better circumstances, but but. You, for the sake of, uh, for the purposes of our, our episode, you are broadcasting from the library, the physical space. Can you tell us a little bit about like how the broadcasting program fits into your library space? Yeah. So it's, there's a little room in the back corner. Um, yeah, small room in the back corner. We have a pretty big library. It's like middle school size. I would say, I think it was like a middle school template. Um, so there's a lot going on in here because we also have these other two rooms. One was like a book room, like a storage room. It's a classroom now. Um, but so far, nobody has wanted to touch the, the broadcasting room. Um, it's pretty small. I mean, you couldn't really, it could be an office, but can't fit very many kids in there. Gotcha. Well, as somebody who has lost two of my offices to, uh, <laughs> I don't know, the social worker, these, uh, you know, the the literacy leading uh, teams, uh, I have lost two of my uh, four offices already, and um, they weren't even attached to the library. So um, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you defend that space. I mean, you're like, oh, fr- <laughs> friends, this is where we, we, this is where we broadcast our, our news. You can't possibly take this for an office because look at all this stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do, yeah. Is there an issue of sound soundproofing when you do your recordings? Is this when the bells are ringing, when you've got uh, other, are the kids passing in class? Are they, you know, how much of, uh, is it an issue when it comes to things like, you know, noise and ambient noise and so forth? Um, not really a problem. It's pretty pretty isolated occasionally i teach out of that room when i'm doing virtual purely virtual as well just because it's if i'm in the library people are going to talk to me no matter what i'm doing (laughs) yeah i could be in the middle of you know instructing and they're going to ask me a question which is fine but it's better to hide um i don't have a lot of noise problems in there so i'm very fortunate um our rooms our building's only five years old and so we are like i am lucky as far as equipment and spacing a lot of that stuff was ready to go so, you know, I sympathize with anybody who is doesn't have that because everything I have needed has pretty much been here. So yeah. I've lucked out in that okay. regard. All right. And and I'm just going to, to be the martyr in this conversation because uh, my buildings were built in the 1930s. So yeah. there we go. <laughs> so I win. I am the biggest martyr in the conversation. I'm, I'm spoiled. <laughs> I, you know what? And it's not a bad idea to recognize that. It's all about attitude. It really certainly would help you keep a better frame of mind going forward uh, to, uh, to the spring. So, you know, I am curious, you know, for the benefit of anybody listening who would hope to create their own broadcasting program, how would you, if you could, improve the space in which you record? Um, it, I think I would prefer to have a painted wall. We have like a big curtain that's draped. So if I were going to do some changes, I would probably get like, I, I think some people do that paint the wall. Um, that would be better because sometimes you'll get like in our news show, I mean, we have goofs and errors and it'll be like, you can see the bottom of the wall under the curtain or just, you know, things like that. So I would like a painted wall. Um, 
My wants for the space are more, we have like so much stuff in there that is more for the high school, like full on broadcast level. I would just like, we have really complex, like really high tech stuff in there. So there's more of a, how do I use all the things that are in here? Dustin, I'm really curious because uh, this isn't a class, you know, how do you go about, and you mentioned that, uh, you know, with the fifth graders all graduating, you were sort of starting off from scratch when it came to creating your news crew. So walk us through how you did that when you decided this is going to happen. I reached out to teachers um, and just asked for recommendations of fifth grade teachers. And so they sent me a list of kids. And pretty much if your teacher said that you were on, you were on. Um, I did get some really great kids. I think that it was a little problematic. They just wanted to be anchors. I don't think that they, because I didn't go through any recruiting thing. Like there's a lot that goes on with, you know, you got to have writers and you got to have, to be effective, you have to learn how to do some video editing. The kids need to. Um, so it was honestly, I will do it differently next year, but I just asked for teacher recommendations. I have a couple of students that I've just gotten to know from them coming in the library. One student in particular who, um, we were like short a person one day or something. And I literally was just like, Hey, you're here. Can you do this? And they jumped on and and like helped me edit a script. And I was like, you're in. Um, so it was teacher recommendation for me. And then just getting to know the kids is how I have my current group. Now, as the year has gone on, I've tried to, one of the things I do to fill time is sometimes I will have flip grid challenges or things like that for early finishers. And I will just say to students, hey, if you do this and it's good, I'll use it on the news. Um, so I already have some fourth graders that I know are going to be on the news next year unless they move because they've already made these awesome videos and, you know, that have already been on the news. Um So I already have in mind some of the kids that I'm going to use. So my plan is to this year, I'm going to probably go with teacher recommendations slash students that I've gotten to know. And like I said, I already have some in mind and going to train them up. Hopefully in the third quarter is my plan, which ends at the end of this month. I haven't planned all of that out yet because I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants. Um, And then next year, I will know at least a a number of the kids that are going to be on my show. And they'll have already learned some of the basics and um yeah that's my plan that's how i'm gonna do it I love that you mentioned they all wanted to be the anchor. And and I, I'll be honest, as somebody who has never done any broadcasting, um, you fail to to appreciate just how much happens behind the scenes. And, uh-huh. um, you know, I, I liken it to the kids who auditioned for the, the school play. And when they, you know, the, the crew, you, you talk about all the roles that aren't on stage. And, and it really, I, I, two of my kids did crew for years with the school play. And, and they, they played in the Hit and because everyone assumes you're on stage, you're you uh-huh. you you're the star, and and you need to recognize there's so much that happens. So you know, I love also the idea of using Flipgrid not only as a way to bring in more voices. You're bringing mm-hmm. in, I, and I think that that's a great way to get um, student interest because people who aren't necessarily in your news crew now have a chance to be featured. And uh-huh. that's how you build an audience is by bringing in more voices and and giving those kids an opportunity to be on your show, even if they aren't in your news crew. And then you mm-hmm. use it to audition. It's basically an audition. Uh huh. Yeah, wow. no, it definitely. And I look at it like that. And I mean, there have just been some kids that have blown me away with their flip grid and they, you know, I don't want to say they're, they're just, they're on it and they know what they're doing. And it's like, they've never, I've never told them how to do any of that. And they just nail it. And it's cool to see that. And if I could make one other suggestion, just something that I wish I had known because mine's a club, I, I have a lot of kids that stay for like aftercare or they come in early. So because mine's mostly done outside of school hours, I've tried to do some work, like make it work it into my lunchtime. It's just too chaotic. Um, having kids that are going to stay late or come in early is just super helpful, almost necessary. So I have some teacher's kids on there and they're like my, if nobody else is here, I know the teacher's kids are going to be here. So if you can get one or two or those, one or two of those kids, um, they're going to really help you out. 
So I wanted to follow up on that because the idea of when this happens, you and I teach a fixed schedule. How do you pull kids for the news crew and not, uh, you know, intrude on instructional time? Because you don't want to wear out your welcome with your grade level, your classroom teachers. Your classroom teachers are going to be incredibly selfish with certain windows of time. And so you sort of have to navigate into places where there's a little more flexibility in their instruction. Our official start time is 6.50 in the morning, and we end at 7.20. Uh-oh. Blacking Wait, out. no, are you kidding me? Wait. Do you, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I'm just marveling. So, friend, what time does school start? Uh, 7.20. Okay. Yeah, I know. It's been a shift. Okay, so anybody looking to move to South Carolina, you better be an early bird. You better just be, you know, drinking that coffee. You're going to be get. I'm telling you, our school doesn't start till eight twenty five, and we still have stragglers. We yeah. st- we well, still have stragglers. It's pretty awesome being off at two forty five every day as well. So that's the. It's so nice to have your evening. So if you're like me, that's I love it. I don't always like waking up that early, but I do like getting off early. So. So when do you pull these kids to be in your news crew, to do your recordings? So they record in the morning, and then whatever we need to finish up gets done after school with the after school kids. Um, I did try and do lunch, but it was just kids would come late, and they're eating, and I don't want to, I mean, they get overworked and stressed and shut down, and they just want to play during their lunch. I mean, it was just not working. Um, And like I mentioned before, if even if I'm in the middle of filming a segment of the news, <laughs> you know, somebody comes in, they're going to talk to me and it just became, I'd get pulled in every direction. Um, and they would. And so, yeah. So before and after school, we just start in the morning, finish it up, you know, in the 10 or 15 minutes it takes after school. Excellent. It's hard to step back and let the kids take charge. And these are without a doubt, student led broadcasts. I mean, how do you do that? You're a club advisor, you know, where do you see yourself exercising some supervision and when do you know to stand back? Um, so my, I will start by saying I want my broadcast to be more student led than it is. Um, they are limited on time. And so I do have to fill in some of those gaps um, just because they don't have time to do it. The things that I would like for them to do, it can be really difficult when you, they will, they will take off with an idea And then like a skit, they love to do skits. And sometimes the the skits are good. And sometimes I'm like, I'm not putting this on the news, like bus safety week. They just wanted to keep doing skits about kids getting hit by buses. And I was like, parents are not going to like to see those skits on the news. Um, So, but, so I don't know. I'm kind of dancing around the question. I just try, and I tried to get better about it. um, Try and just talk with them, like talk try and make the skits conversational or the scripts conversational. And so I'll just kind of talk them through it a little bit. And what would you say if you were trying to explain this? Um, Try and, you know, I tell them all the time, it's your school news show. Um, How do you want to present this information? I have just started posting. We do like January or, you know, monthly newsletters. I've started putting that in their Google classroom So they, a lot of times it's like, we know we need to do this thing. It's just a matter of how do we, or we need to present this information. It's a matter of how do we present it. Um, And it can be difficult. This is just another, this happened actually yesterday. So I was frustrated because I was trying to, one of the difficult things about our show is getting like different media and the right format to fit into iMovie or just getting it from one iPad to the other. Um, And so sometimes I'll be really frustrated with the students and be like, they're not doing what I want at all. And then sometimes I will be frustrated with another situation and they will find the solution. Like yesterday, I was trying to get these photos into our new show and they were like, well, they're posted in the hallway. Let's just go take pictures of them. And I was like, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, let's do that. That's way easier than, I mean, I had already airdropped it to different iPads and gone to Google Drive and tried to download it and like everything was not working. And then they just figured it out. Um, so you just have to kind of stand back and like, there are going to be days where you're going to have to pick up the slack. Or, I mean, some people do have a well-oiled machine that they're running. Like AJ Chambers, the guy that I was talking about earlier, he just, he seems to have his students and I've seen them at work. It, you know, they're going to the classes. Um, 
but so you have to let you have to just be willing to let the students like solve your problems sometimes when I'm here banging my head against the wall and they go off and do it a different way. Okay, we're going that way now because that makes more sense. But I I love the example that you gave us because um, it's such an empowering experience for a student to solve a problem, which legitimately is uh, presented. So, you know, it unlike where we sort of tend to fabricate problems and, and to, and, and make up scenarios that we want our students to try and solve to, 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 uh, create sort of a, a creative thinking opportunity, you know, problem based learning. You're actually, these are actual legit problems. You are not doing this out of the benefit because you want to have your students learn how to solve problems. These are actually ones that come up whenever you're broadcasting and, and they, have to appreciate that as participants in this program, I, that's got to be building their confidence. They are, uh-huh. they are seen more as a, you know, they're a team and, and they are supporting you in this program. And this program happens in large part because of what they are doing as, uh, you know, in being part of the news crew. And so you're, you're, those learning experiences, oftentimes, you know, trying to replicate those in the classroom and making them authentic, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. You know, you're having authentic problems. You don't have yeah. to. Fa- you don't have to fabricate them. And sometimes I will think something is silly that they want to do. Like I mentioned, the bus thing. Like I was not going to let them do skits about kids getting hit by a bus. But another example of that is. We had like days of the week, you know, spirit days, and one of them was Elf Day, and we were going to do some interviews and. My idea for like the questions were completely different than what they came up with. They were asking all the teachers who dressed like elves, like really as if they were elves, like, I don't know, questions about their life as elves. And so I just thought the teachers were going to be like, this is so like just dumb. I thought that they were going to walk in and be like, so what's your favorite elf food? You know, and the teacher would be like, I'm just pretending to be an elf, but the teachers went with it. And it was one of our like funniest episodes of the year because they were just talking about their life stories as an elf. And my dad was an elf and my dad, but he compared it to being a blacksmith or having a trade. So, you know, they, I guess those are the moments when it's like, it doesn't always pan out the way they want to do things, but sometimes it's like something that I never would have come up with. So (laughs) those are fun. This seems to be a reoccurring theme of how students turn out to be incredibly helpful to us in our library programming, and in this case, your broadcasting, because they come up with ideas that, in in your case, you just hadn't even occurred to you. I know this came up in Tuesday Chambers' uh, episode with her um, library assistants, and I, I know also um, that Lucas Maxwell mentioned that his podcast team uh, oftentimes comes up with these, you know, ideas and and giving the kids the opportunity to use this platform has really, I'm sure, been uh, an incredibly rewarding experience and memorable for them on so many levels. I, I want to make sure we focus on uh, a big question that listeners want to know about, and that is equipment. So, you know, I appreciate that, you know, there's a, you can run the gamut with the high tech and the bare bones. Could you tell us what you use, uh, first of all, currently? So on a daily basis, you know, we, we have a green screen. Um, we have, we have a podcaster, I believe it's called. It's like an iPad stand that's really fancy and you can get the nice pan shots. And then we just have a really cheap one that just sits right in front of the news desk. Um, and it kind of wobbles and that's the one that gets used daily. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just quick and easy. We use two iPads. One is mostly the recording iPad. And then the other is we use it mostly for editing. They both get used They both get used for videos and pictures, but one gets used for editing because I've gone taken it home and downloaded the iMovie music onto it. And the other one, I've just never done that. Um, I use AirDrop all the time because I use iPads. That has just been like, I never AirDropped before. All I knew about AirDrop as a high school teacher was that a lot of things got AirDrop that shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Um, So I never used it and I use it like on a daily basis. They have Chromebooks. We're a one-to-one school. And so while I would like to get a teleprompter type situation with either an app, and I've kind of looked into it, we've just, the easiest thing is just some Google Slides. Um, and then we also have a Google Classroom. So I post our week, our schedule, I would say weekly, but it's pretty much just has been the same. I change it quarterly, who comes in on what day. Um, I post 
have started trying to do better about posting like the news that they need to present so that I can just say, open up the newsletter. What do you want to talk about today? We need to, you know, get these things on there. And from day to day, those, that's what we use. Um, and I posted an article from JEA Digital, I believe it was, which was something that I was kind of fishing for resources to help people. Um, so this was not a resource that I had, but it does talk about just the merits of like an iP- iPod setup. Um, it's just, if you're looking, if you're in a situation like me where you're not doing a broadcasting class, I just think the iPads have made it so easy and quick. And so while we have these big fancy cameras in our newsroom that I eventually do want to learn how to use, we're just like, you know, quick <laughs> grabbing videos where we can walk out in the hallway. Where's the student? Let's grab them. Um, and the iPads have, you know, really fit that style. Well, and I know that doing um, hallway interviews, uh, you would want to go with something that's easy and portable. Um, do, uh-huh. do you use microphones? So we don't use microphones. We have used microphones here and there over the course of the year. Um, I invested in like a small kind of microphone. It got broken. It just wasn't up for the um, the fast paced task, I guess, that I'm asking my kids to do. We have some fancier mics. Um, the problem I mostly find is just with disconnecting the iPads and then carrying them around and this, you know, it's just, it's one more thing to deal with and we're already so strapped for time. Um, so I would like to, I just need to do some more research on that part um, to find something that would just be quick and easy. And the sound works. You can balance the sound in um, iMovie. So if it's a little too quiet, you can make it louder. As somebody who uh, works a little bit in audio, um, you know, this is amateur hour. We This isn't CNN. This isn't NPR. Uh-huh. This isn't the BBC. And, and really, content is king. And if you give your audience something that interests them and val- and a reason to listen, um, hope, the hope is that, that they would be more forgiving because mm-hmm. their interest in what you have, especially when you're doing those flip grids and they see themselves on your, uh-huh. on your show, um, you know, I think everyone is far, far more forgiving when they re- when they get excited about the content. Uh-huh. So, you know, I would agree. I am curious because, uh, you know, I, I asked you about your space, but if you received a grant today to invest in your equipment, it sounds like you've got, you know, you, you really like what you've got and you even have, uh, you know, more, uh, expensive, you know, it sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like all you need is time to, to play around with technology. And, and I don't know, would it make sense to collaborate with your counterparts at the middle school and the high school? I mean, I'm just curious. So we have an innovation specialist at our school and he's kind of, um, I would say, I wouldn't say pushing, but, you know, he's made some suggestions. He's come in and messed with the cameras. I think he's excited for me to start working with them. And really, like you said, just time. I just need time to play with it. I had hoped we had a fully virtual week last week. I had hoped that I would be able to spend some time on it last week, but I didn't. I, yeah, anyway. Um, So I wasn't able to do that. And... One thing that I know that I want, and I think I'm willing to spend some money on this even before I've tried it, is I posted at the bottom the curriculum suggestions. The ASB classroom has been recommended to me. Um, I am curious, if for no other reason for myself, to just get some video editing um, expertise because I'm not a video, audiovisual person. Um, This is new to me. So some kind of curriculum that I can have the kids work through where they're learning those skills that because of the rush nature of how we started this year and just everything that's going on, they're lacking in some of those audio visual skills that I would like for future students. I want to spend some more time um, working on those things. So something like that would be useful for me. Something like the one that I posted in there. Um, If I were going to have some money to spend, I would like gimmicky things, costumes, (laughs) um, just like fun props, puppets. We have a little puppet like stage, but only like one. I've made like yardstick puppets and things like that. So some puppets would be cool. Um, And those aren't really things that I would have thought of, you know, if you don't. But once you have the cameras and things, then it's like, what can we use to to entertain people? So um, costumes, puppets 
some curriculum type things. Those are things that I'm looking into getting more of as I continue the program. Wow. Oh, I, it's I, nice to hear about the things you'd like to do uh, moving forward. And, you know, very exciting. I'm sure your building is thrilled that you are not only uh, d- broadcasting from the library, but you are uh, looking uh, for ways to expand it. So, you know, how has being in charge of uh, the school broadcast impacted your library program? Um, well, I've talked about a few of the things. So I hear a lot of people talk about as a special teachers, uh, a special teacher, when you walk down the hall, like, you know, every kid knows you. And that's the case. Like, and I think even maybe I can't, you know, speak, but kids are willing, like they recognize me and they want to be on the news and they associate me with like coming around a video recording people. So I think that they like seek me out a little bit sometimes to try and just, get some attention. It works as a good motivator. Um, like I said, in class, you know, Hey, do this thing and then record yourself, you know, students that maybe wouldn't spend as much time on something otherwise are going to, because they want to have that payoff of possibly being on the news. Um, everything that I want to put on the news gets on the news. So if I have something that I want people to know about, Hey, it's on the news. And then it's, not enough people are doing it. It's on the news again. And then, you know, so, um, we need to do some Chromebook care, like a Chromebook care series, for example. So, you know, that's coming up. So I just feel like I have a platform to anything that I think is important to the school or my library. I have a place to put it that at least the people in the school are going to see it. And that's my audience. So, um, if I have something that needs to get out there or a challenge, you know, we do reading incentives. And then if ki- not a lot of kids are doing the reading challenges that we put out there, put a kid who's done it on the news. And then suddenly, like we do, we're doing a quarter two Rito and none had come in, no sheets. And we were like, you know, it's just kind of disheartening when you're trying to do these reading incentives. And I did a special about the one kid who had brought it in. And since then, it's just been, you know, lots of kids know or saw it on the news. And so now they want their we have a book vending machine and that's like the prize for completing it. So now they want to be on the, you know, want to get their book vending machine tokens so that they can, you know, so um, that's the biggest impact. So just, yeah, um, it's nice. And as a, as a book person and a librarian and a former English teacher, like I love just having kids like, Hey, do you have a book you like, you want to talk about it? Um, That kind of thing. Or if I have a book, that I just want to like read out loud to the kids and I can just do that because, and nobody's going to complain. I mean, worst case scenario, the teacher will just be like, we're not watching this right now. And then, you know, so I feel like I get to teach. I get to do a lot of my like teachy things through the news. And that's a neat experience. I think what's so exciting listening to you, you, you've already mentioned how your broadcast is building school-wide culture. And now it sounds like because the person in charge of the broadcasting is the school librarian, you have recognized an opportunity to build a school-wide reading culture because mm-hmm. you can use this, your, your angle is, is literacy, your angle is your library, your angle are all the things that happen in your library, which all, you know, promote learning and, and help your students' academic achievement. listeners working with their students remotely and working with their staffs remotely, what workarounds have you found to include your virtual students in the broadcast that you are making with the students who come to school? Well, I already talked about one of them, which is Flipgrid um, is a good tool that the students pick up on quickly. Um, I've had students do special segments like about what they did for Hour of Code or different things, favorite books. We, I had students prepare a book feast on Flipgrid before Thanksgiving, and so they shared what their book feast was going to be. Um, and you can actually download Flipgrid videos. I'm pretty sure I checked this actually. And so you can like drop them right into your iMovie. Um, other ways that I try, it's not foolproof, but I mean, just mentioning the fact that we're like virtual, you know, like we're all together. So I try to bring that up 
in the script sometimes like welcome back whether you're virtual or whatever we're glad you're with us um and then the only other real tool that i would say i use is you can put pictures you know you can just do the kin the iMovie does the kin burns where the photographs will like move as you're looking at them so if you get photos submitted of students then you can put those on there um and one cool thing that we did i a show that we did we had the the public library the bookmobile come to our school and kind of advertise that as something for virtual students you know you don't have to come in the building you can get something out of the bookmobile so um when they came to the school for that we were able to do some pictures so I know different schools have different situations um, as far as that goes, but like if there are any of, you know, just events that aren't like at the school or during the school days, if you can just get a couple pictures and put those on there. Um, I have students who come for running club, like they're allowed to come for running club after school or they, their parents don't care because it's outside. So different clubs and outreaches like that um, are ways that I found to put kids who are on the virtual pathway onto the show because they're not there but um i hope that you know they see themselves and that's kind of the appeal to me is just if you are at home you can still feel like a community if you see your classmate or your um you know yourself on the news so well and i know that you know parents especially appreciate the support that their students are receiving when they are trying to teach uh, virtually dustin you've been so incredibly generous and i i wouldn't be surprised if you've inspired a few people to look into the opportunity to do this or make some immediate changes to the programs they currently have in their program could i ask would you let us know how listeners could reach out to you if with a uh, cute questions or if they wanted to follow you on social media. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can follow me capital D underscore W underscore McConnell. That's M-C-C-O-N-N-E-L-L. I get asked every time. So Um, and I'm not super active on there, but I believe you can still direct message. So that would be one way to follow me or get in touch with me. Um, And yeah, that's probably the best way just to quickly send me a message over that. I do check it a lot. I'm just, I have a bad habit of checking out all the things that are like bad on there when I should be using it for like, you know, inspiring things. Um, So I just am not as active on there, especially as of late, I would say. Yes, I do feel that doom scrolling on Twitter Uh is not nearly... Yeah, it's not nearly as satisfying as, as scrolling on library Twitter. And so... Uh-huh, the, yeah, no, it's not. Yeah, the library <laughs> Twitter community is incredibly supportive. And my, it, vir- it is, yes. my virtual PLN is one that I rely on almost as much as I do the coworkers I see uh, face-to-face. Dustin, you've been an incredibly generous guest. I, I'm so grateful you came and shared your expertise. Thank you so much. And I wish you the very best with the year going forward. Thank you. I am so excited to have had this opportunity to share this conversation with Dustin and especially to be able to share it with everyone. And I can't emphasize this enough, friends. The show notes are just remarkable. You will find a great deal of information if you are looking to start a broadcasting program from your library, you're looking to improve your broadcasting program, you know, and and it, it might just inspire something that you maybe take on today or tomorrow or a year from now. Either way, it was a great conversation. I truly appreciate everything Dustin has done to put together these resources. And I hope that you truly enjoy everything that we shared today. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. And if you really liked listening today, please subscribe on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. The topic of our next episode will be Collaborating with Public Librarians and my conversation with Harry Koffel. I hope you will tune in.